The following is a Spirit Street production. You've discovered your link to the Power Cap Podcast, presented by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. It's the Power Cap Podcast. And now, let's go to the Spirit Street Studios. Here's your host, Go Power Cat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast. For the off week, it is the bye week. Kansas State goes in to its off week with a 3-4 and four record. 1-3 and three in the Big 12 now after a fairly impressive win over Oklahoma State on Saturday at Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Uh, it's the Powercat Podcast. Fitz, Riley, Zach, your podcasting trio. Trio. Yes. Trio. Hey, Are we brought like to an you appetizer. By, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we're brought to you by Tanner's Bar and Grill. I was in Tanner's on uh, Sunday night before the Chiefs game. That's all I want to talk about. That. Yeah. I was in there. It's not really worth talking about anything else. Had very good service. Had some nice. Uh, Snacks. Um, uh, then, uh, Not a full meal. No. Well, I had sliders. Those are snacks. Snacks. I'm gonna be honest. Some it's mozzarella not, sticks. It's not, a, it's not a snack. It's a lot of people might think it's like a dog on on Tanner's, but I kind of just prefer to get a meal there than maybe that some of their appetizers. Oh, I like their mozzarella sticks. Okay, I haven't had those. In fairness, uh, I like their uh, their fried pickles are very good. I think I got a bad taste once because like the cheese balls are really good if you're into like. Spicy things, and I'm just not. Okay. So I had those, and ah. Speaking but, of cheese balls, hey Zach, best burgers in town. That doesn't make any sense. I don't. I don't know. Uh, they're pretty damn good burgers. I'll give you that. I load them up with almost everything you can. Yeah, the KC burger is pretty good. Fried mushrooms. Where they put the pulled pork on top of the onions. burger with a with a onion ring and barbecue sauce. Mmm. We better not talk about it because I'm hungry. Uh, Tanner's is our first segment sponsor, and we're brought to you by The Fridge. The Fridge Wholesale Liquor. It's not actually a fridge, by the way. It's normal temperatures uh, in there. They they have have fridges fridges in there in which they have cooled products, but the entire building is not a fridge. It's a very enjoyable, comfortable environment in which to uh, shop for liquor and beer and other such things. It's right there on the corner of Claflin and Westport. You finally got it right. Right there, across from the Taco Bell. Drop by the fridge, and maybe you'll see Bill Snyder eating in the Taco Bell. Think Probably actually, won't. Think, think he actually ever has ever dined in? Like, like he no. pulls up, and he's going to go through the drive through and then realizes it's like seven minutes to home. That's an interesting question, though. Do you think he's ever sat down in a fast food chain of anywhere? Because I don't think so. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure No way. Is. I'm sure back no when way. he uh, was on the road, maybe. Not in Manhattan, Kansas. I no. Mean. No, 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 no. I doubt, I doubt too. But that'd be really interesting, you know? Like, Bill, I can't make it home. I really want to get my taco on. Bam! Let's do it right here. I feel like if you asked any of the workers if Bill drops by, they'd be like, who? Like, I don't know who our customers are. Yeah, that's are. exactly. They'd be like, I, I literally think that. And he could go through there know. every day, and I think some people that work there would be like, this guy's the who? best. <laughs> He's our best regular. This, this old Bill. guy eats at Taco Bell every day. <laughs> that's what they would say. You do sound a lot like a Taco Bell employee. That's good impersonation of it. <laughs> but stop it in the fridge. Say hi to Kevin and the entire gang. As they kick everyone else's butt in the liquor industry here in Manhattan, Kansas. Is that possible for a liquor store to kick butt? Sure. They do. I don't know. Better call ATF. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we had a long discussion about a, a topic I don't want to discuss right now, but it involved uh, butts and chugging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if you're into anything that relates to those two things, stop in the fridge and get your products. No. <laughs> Bell five, sorry. I just, That's, things we talk about during the off week. We don't have a lot of things to talk about. We, of course, take our questions from Wabash Station. And uh, coming off a win, apparently people are sated like, okay, I got nothing here. I got nothing. We're fine. 
But and it's off week, so I think everyone shifted down. So it's not going to be a real long podcast. We've gone long the last two weeks. Some of you like that. Some of you don't. I've ranted and raved, and uh, you can ignore most of what I said because I won. Uh, Ready on a scale of 1 to 10, how surprised were you that K-State beat Oklahoma State? I know you had the spread uh, rather impressively in Oklahoma State's favor, but just – one to ten, how surprised were you that they won? I would say seven, seven, maybe eight, because I'm. I know this is always easy to say after the fact, and like you get to pretend like, oh yeah, yeah, I knew it. I literally came into the week and like after talking to players at the press conference last Tuesday, I was like, you know, it wouldn't shock me if they won. I didn't have enough confidence to pick them, as evidenced by my twenty-two, 22 point. point Oklahoma State spread. Um, I picked K-State by 10. But, or, excuse me, Oklahoma State by 10. But I did kind of have a vibe going into that week. I just didn't have enough confidence to pick them. So I'll say a 7 because as a, I thought for sure Oklahoma State was going to flip the switch at halftime. Like, holy cow, there's no way they're going to be able to yeah, they contain did. them. To off. Yeah. Uh, how surprised were you on a scale of 1 to 10 that they won by 19 freaking points? Uh, very. Yeah, I was about a 10 on that. It's thing. funny because, like, the Mississippi State game, uh, the West Virginia game, like, all these other games, I've been able to, like, start riding my post-game edge, like, third quarter because mm-hmm. um, the game's over. Basically, yep. And this time I could have done that with K-State, except I-, I was so shocked. I didn't – I've never written it that early for K-State this year. This season, yep. It's weird. It was a weird situation. To it be was in. impressive. They looked very good the second half. We'll see if they can perpetuate it uh, when they go to Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma with a really crappy defense, but they have thrown Mike Stoops under the bus and hired. It's not like they've had an awful or they've had an amazing defense in years past. Promoted Ruffin McNeil. Ruffin McNeil, former East Carolina head coach. He has two L's in his name. Former Texas Tech defensive coordinator. I wonder, uh, Zach, if you had a son, would you name him Ruffin? Ruffin Carlson? No. Ruffin Carlson. If you had a dog, would you name him Ruffin? That's a pretty good dog name. (laughs) That is a pretty good dog name. I'll give you that. Ruffin the dog. Ruffin the dog. Okay, here we go. Your questions from Wabash Station and with the first half here. I don't know what we got, but here we go. From Garcat12761, so did Bill Snyder remember to make adjustments, or is Oklahoma State a very bad team? Oklahoma State's not a bad team. They're not as good as they have been in years past. They are past. down, and they're, they're feeling sorry for themselves, I think. They're going to make a bowl, I think. I mean, I don't think it'll be a good bowl, but I think they'll make a bowl. Man, they got a lot of work to do. they got They got to win two games in five. I, the odds are in their favor. I know it's a tough schedule, but also, did you expect Iowa State to beat West Virginia? So, I mean, literally, it, it's like that cliche that the players always say, anyone can beat anybody on any given day. Which but is, it's true. Which is true in the Big 12, so unless you're KU. Um, but, but even they have won a game. Kansas beat Texas. Kansas beat Texas. Two years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, it's gonna be the same thing that case like K State fans hanging that like, that O six year beating Texas for a while, although they kept well, beating Texas. Um Yeah, I don't know. Oklahoma State's Oklahoma State came apart in the second half. But and it was because K State did it to them. They just beat the snot out of them at the point of attack. They couldn't on both sides of the ball. I thought K State was really good in the second half. We had seen uh, literally no sign of that to the first six games of the season. There was no sign that they had that gear. And I think they played really well. Now, can they continue that? If they can continue that, they're going to beat TCU in Fort Worth. And that that is that becomes the linchpin game. They're, in all likelihood, they're going to lose to Oklahoma. Okay? I just don't think they can outscore Oklahoma. Um, then, if you get the TCU game, now we're talking. Now we're talking because you just have to win your home games against Kansas and Texas Tech, which is good, but the game's in Manhattan, and then you're bowl eligible. But I think uh, winning at Oklahoma is too much to ask, and maybe winning at Iowa State in the last game of the season might be too much to ask. But this conference is wacky. It's wacky. 
from Purple Cheese. Can we all agree how disappointing the quarterback play has been overall from both Skyler and Alex? Skyler looks like he has either regressed as a passer or at the very least not improved since last year. How does that happen, coaching or receivers? This is a game where you have to look past the box score, I think. Skyler played a really, really good second half. I mean, he was dreadful in the first half. Yeah, that's the thing. And he was awful in the first half. Um, it's, I, I think that the quarterback play has been all, you know, it's been pretty poor, like, like he said in the question. But also, I, I feel like it's not, oh man, if only the quarterback play was good, K State would be a much better team. Like, I, I feel like it's just kind of a collective thing um, that it all kind of piles into that. <sighs> There's no doubt it's been awful. It's been awful quarterback play. I mean, outside of what uh, was it? South Dakota and UTSA they threw for over 200. I forget off the top of my head, but it hasn't been good. Um, and and it kind of goes like I said everywhere. It, it doesn't help that they don't have good receivers. It doesn't help that they haven't had a good offensive line in an established running game. But also. Both quarterbacks have made poor decisions this season. Both quarterbacks have a lot of things they can improve on. And I just think that I think it goes to Alex Delton not being an incredibly pass, incredible passing quarterback. And I think it goes to Skylar Thompson being young and still trying to figure it out, frankly. I agree with all that. Skyler has regressed a little bit, but I, I feel like we know there's another gear in there. And if he finds that gear, the offense will get even better than it was in the second half. But the lack of game-changing players at receiver is really hurting K-State. Really hurting them. Because you can point at the stat, the stats from last year and go, well, Byron and Dominique Heath weren't, you know, all that you know, amazing. But what you forget is that those guys being on the field and being the numbered one and two options made it easy for Dalton Schoen to get open over the middle and things like that. So it's – it's a different role and guys like Dalton guys like Zach Reuter are not supposed to be in the positions they're in this season from Sir Wright. If Dalton was healthy, how quick would uh, Snyder have pulled him for Tom or pulled Thompson for him? Interesting. I, I don't know. I, something tells me it would have been early, you know, and that's, it's a very interesting question to pose because then what happens to the entire game? Mm-hmm. And does K-State go on to win? I mean, you kind of change things. I don't know. Um, it's a tough question. It really is a tough question. I, I think you probably would have pulled him in the first half. I think you would have had to have. He was one of seven or something like that. Hey, I am, I am now becoming serious about this. When he's healthy, I, I'm beginning to think you need to start Alex Delton and then play Skylar Thompson in the second half. It's bizarre. I this am, kid is so much better in second halves than first halves. It's it, it's defies explanation to me yeah i understand that and i think it's great to to play that but also i think if you start alex delton you're gonna dig yourself a really big hole i.e texas yeah true from cliff cliff clavin 754 which statement is more accurate thompson lacks confidence in his receivers and the passing game in general k-state's receivers lack physical tools to get separation on their routes and the hands required to catch passes I'm not going to buy either answer. I'm going to say Skyler's just been inexact in his throwing. There's been a lot of times where I mean, he, he throws behind. Yeah, he, low. he was – I mean, he had some really nice passes earlier in the season, and now he's just not as good. Just not. He's not putting the ball where it needs to go. But, yeah, and, and it's like – I think the frustrating thing is a lot of those you're like – well, we, we've seen you make such money throws before that we know he's not just making those throws because he's bad. You know, we we've watched him drop two balls over the the back shoulder of, of defenders right into Dalton Schoen's arms. That's a perfect throw. We've watched him, you know, thread needles last season against Oklahoma State, but this year he can't hit Alex Barnes wide open in the flats at Baylor with you know with nobody around him. He can't hit a guy over the middle that, that has a jump on his guy and instead he throws behind him. And and I don't know. I mean, I'm not educated enough in the quarterback, uh, you know, in, in how quarterbacks play, how quarterbacks coach, things like that, to really point, like, why is he doing that? Because obviously he's not doing it intentionally. Um, but I don't I – can't, I can't really point to why he's struggling the way he is. And 
it just it's shocking to me because we didn't expect to see him play like that. We didn't expect to see him struggle in the, in this way. Agreed. From I like pickles cat is Colin Klein a good quarterbacks coach? Too early. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it's not I, fair to judge him on this. Season. Yeah, and we can't see him coach. I mean, you know, I I find it hard to believe he wouldn't be. I really do. So we'll see. Maybe it's sometimes it's the pupils, not the teacher. And Colin Klein. All those teachers out there know that. For everything Colin Klein wasn't as a thrower, he knows how to throw the ball. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he knows. He knows how to coach it for sure. And obviously, he. Got, I don't mean to make it sound like he was an awful quarterback. He just wasn't exactly the greatest throwing quarterback in the world. He was better than Nick Fitzgerald, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, I'm setting that bar a little low, I think. That's okay. We're going to leave it at that. <laughs> From Yo Mama, the offensive line revival. What causes a veteran group like this to apparently forget how to play the game, then all of a sudden remember at halftime at Baylor? They didn't forget the techniques. They didn't forget the schemes. They didn't forget anything other than passion. I mean, these guys are getting after it. They're playing angry. They haven't done that. They really didn't do that last year. They are getting nasty with people, and it's exactly what – I hope he's not listening to this because he'll think I'm blowing up his ego. Exactly what Marcus Watts has been saying. They don't get mean to other teams. And for the last five halves, starting with the second half of Texas, they've done it. They, they're they blowing people off the ball. They absolutely dominated a pretty good Oklahoma State run defense. They controlled them. The running game just – Pretty good as the number one in the Big 12. Yeah, some of that is – is a little deceptive. They've been so bad in the past defense, people have thrown against them. But they they are decent against the run, and K-State bullied them. And that's – me personally, that's what I want from a running game. Yeah, I like long runs. That's cool. But what they did to them in the second half might have broken them for the season. We'll see what happens going forward. I guess I just want to know, like, how did it happen? You know, how did they get to the point where they needed to – quote, become nasty, become mean. Because you, you mentioned it. They weren't necessarily that way last year. I mean, they just kind of got the job done. Um, and nobody complained about them last year. And it's not like they lost anything. It's not like – it's almost like they thought that their strength, their experience was going to overpower people, I guess, to an extent, maybe something like that, because they just weren't doing it. And, and I'm sorry – you can tell me all you want that we don't sit in the film room and watch with them, so maybe we're not seeing things that they actually did right. But at the end of the day, the numbers didn't lie. They were not doing as many things right in earlier games as Dalton Reisner says they did right. I agree. From Jim Cat, did anyone see what the deal was with Tyler Mitchell's unnecessary roughness penalty? How does that happen in the pile at the line of scrimmage? I think what happened was he fell on the guy's head. I think um, he was, I, I think what happened is he sort of dipped his own head and it looked like spearing. But he didn't really I mean he didn't really spear the I think it was a bad call at the end of the day, but he did kind of lead with his helmet a little bit. I think the re- official overreacted. To me, he was doing nothing more than do what you're taught and that's drive through the whistle, finish your block out. And I think he was finishing his block, and it just so happened at the wrong time he was putting a guy on his back. And Well, he, he jumped on a guy, but every offensive lineman's trained to do that. Don't let your guy get back up. Yeah. Get on top of him, but he did kind of dip his helmet into the guy. It was a weak call. A weak Let's call. say that. Of everything that gets called in football and doesn't get called in football, you don't make that call. And I've, I've also never seen – five players at once so definitively showing their emotion and disagreement with a call. Like they were all just like throwing their hands at the ref. And I'm I like, loved his reaction. He was like the crowd, the students were booing and he's like, yeah, pump him up. Like he, like he was doing the pump up arms. Like it was, it was funny. <laughs> yeah. And then he had the Reggie Walker on sportsman. Like he went for one bow too many. It was, like he was, he did all the bows and then he does the little like high f- wh- whatever little dance was and that's when he got the penalty. How pissed do you think the coaches are at Reggie right now <laughs> between a between a head to head penalty and then sportsman like conduct penalty? I think he's in a little bit of a doghouse. But hey, so what many am- stairs. What an amazing dance that he had on the, the Fortnite <laughs> bow. <laughs> Last question of the first half from Wildcat Shocks. How much did the loss of Dominique Heath impact this team? I think it did. Yeah. Another receiver? Another return guy? 
I mean, I brought it up last week. You, we talk about the guys who went through the NFL, but Dominic Keith transferring out for a senior year, that hurts. There was nobody to replace him. I mean, he's a better Isaiah Zuber, for real. I think he was better than Zuber. Well, he's, he certainly gives you another option, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, it's it's bad. And he gives you seen, another, you know, he's probably back there on kickoffs, too. And have you seen him and Corey Sutton are really tearing it up right now at App State? Well, they're at App State, too. They're big 12 Yeah, but they're making, they're making plays. They're like, at App State. I, I think Dominique is a Big 12 player. I think Corey could have been a Big 12 player, but I think Corey needs to be at that level. He needs to be the dude, man. That's what it's, he needs to be. But he's pretty good. He's made some really nice plays. But um, I'd kill for Corey Sutton to be here right now. Oh, if they had them right, both right now, but they'd be in good shape with their receiving core. But um, Corey just, I don't know, needed something else. He wasn't a good fit. Let's put it that way. I mean, he's a fine fit until the incident. I mean, for real. Uh, just, he was, I think it eventually he was not going to be happy one way or another. So we'll see um, how he plays out at App State. But, yeah, Dominic Heath, question was about him. Hell yes, they could use him. Hell yes, they'd be better off in receiving and returning. And, and just it would really greatly help. But they don't have him. They have what they have. They pulled a red shirt. Um, and we'll see what that means moving forward. We'll be back with the second half of the Power Cap podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor, right after this. The Power Cap podcast continues shortly. I'm trying to get a group text in on what everybody wants on the liquor store run, but my phone keeps auto-correcting liquor store to the fridge. A fridge or the fridge? The fridge. It just did it again. Well, the fridge is more than just a liquor store. The fridge has over 3,000 wines in stock, the area's largest selection of spirits and craft beers, plus their back-to-back winners of Beverage Dynamics Retailer of the Year. Oh, I get it. Wow. Smartphone. Auto-correct your next liquor store visit to the Fridge Wholesale Liquor, 1150 Westport in Manhattan, online at fridgeliquor.com. For more than 20 years, there's only been one reliable source for exclusive and unmatched premium K-State sports news content. It's GoPowerCat.com. The tradition continues as Tim Fitzgerald, D. Scott Fritchin, and the other GoPowerCat sports experts continue their relentless coverage of K-State sports. So make sure you're subscribing to the one and only GoPowerCat. Hey, K-State fans, it's time to come home to GoPowerCat.com. We now return to the Power Cat Podcast. We effort forward with the Power Cat Podcast. Effort. Look, guys, it's an off week. And when I say guys, I mean listeners. Because there's gals too, but you know, guys kind of a generic term in some ways. Although my this is a bugaboo of my wife. Don't take a call by everyone, guys. There's gals. There's females. Look, everyone, it's an off week. We didn't get a ton of questions. There's not a ton of topics. But we'll be back next week with much more expansive discussions of Kansas State football and athletics leading up to a game at Oklahoma. You guys will be fired up. We'll be fired up. But we got big plans around here in the office the next two days. Wednesday and Thursday, once the podcast is up, we're going to start painting, putting down a little carpet tile. Stupid name. Carpet squares in in a new studio as we get a new audio studio. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Zach would like it to be a video studio, too. We just haven't figured out how to make it look nice. Yeah. I think the little sound squares are going to look fine. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We are brought to you by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Speaking of squares that ended up looking fine. They used the square from Blockbuster Video and made it their sign. It looks fine. <laughs> it's a rectangle. Square rectangle. Yeah. Whatever. Was it? Is it all squares or rectangles or all rectangles or squares? All all squares. It's are all rectangles. squares or rectangles. That's what I thought. The former, not yes. the latter. As a rectangle is not a square. So it, you are right. It's a rectangle, but it's not even a rectangle because someone took a bite out of the corner. <laughs> 
It's a deformed rectangle. I mean, it's it's a ticket that was ripped. Shut up and stop bringing logic into Let's this call argument. It what it is. I don't think so. I think it was someone from Taco Bell. Got hungry and think about it. <laughs> Speaking of the fridge, so I was in there. Uh, my roommate's girlfriend texted me, and she's like, hey. Um, what are you doing? Are you naked? <laughs> no, and that's not what she said at all. Oh, okay. She, uh, she goes to school in Colorado Springs, and he's here, obviously. So um, she, wow, my Siri just went off. That's nice. Yeah. So she was like, can you pick him up some some whiskey and some cigars? And I'm like, oh, perfect, the fridge, because it's a cigar shop, right? Right, right. So I got I got the whiskey, and then I was like, hey, I need to go get some cigars. So the girl walked back there with me to, to do the, because I got the separate cash mm-hmm. register, all that crap. On the sign of the humidor room, it says, please leave door closed. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, they probably have it locked. You know, they don't want people going in there and opening it and leaving it open. So I, like, stood there at the door waiting for her to come unlock it, assuming it was locked. No. I stood there for probably 15, 20 seconds before she goes, you you can go in. And I was like, oh, my bad. I thought the door was locked because of the sticker. And she goes, you'd be surprised how many people actually think that. And I was like, you should get a different sticker. She probably said that just to make you feel better. You're she the probably first did. first person to do that. <laughs> So, do you, what, so go to the fridge for cigars. So uh, does he know at this point that he's getting whiskey and cigars? Yeah. So we their didn't ruin anything? Their anniversary was on Sunday. Oh, uh, three weeks? A year. A year, okay. That is uh, the, the cigar anniversary, one year of dating. Cigars and crown honey. Hmm. Is that her name? Yes, that's her name. Crown honey? <laughs> Good Crown Lord. Honey in Colorado Springs. So go to the fridge. Go to the fridge. Home of Crown Honey and cigars. Yeah, that's it. That's what I'm doing with them. Hey, uh, also stop by Wahoo. Get into Wahoo. God, we had brunch there on Sunday. It was so good. It was just so good. I, I had their, their pepper steak, uh, chicken fried steak. Oh, oh I had that oh. on for brunch uh, on Easter. Mm-hmm. So good. Two over easy eggs on top. Over easy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eggs. Huh. What? What do you got against eggs, man? Blandest food. I'm supposed to put pepper and salt or hot sauce or They're whatever. very nutritious. Okay. Blandest yeah. food. The guy gets a hamburger with... Yeah, no doubt. Like mustard, maybe. Just take everything off of that that has flavor. Just give me meat. Get it medium so it's not really good or bad. (laughs) Put it between two pieces of bread. Nothing fancy. I don't want those little seeds caught in my teeth. No no pickles or lettuce or tomato. No mustard and ketchup. No, he gets mustard. Ketchup and mustard? It's Limited ketchup and mustard. I don't want to get too crazy. (laughs) Ah, now you can get a t- you can get a burger at Wahoo. You ever had the burger at Wahoo? Uh, yeah, they also offer a buffalo the bison burger. burger. Yeah, the bison burger. That's the one I had. I need to get back mm-hmm. into Wahoo. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. Wahoo, right there at the corner of Eleventh and Morrow, on the adult end of Aggieville. That's what I'm calling it. Now. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Questions from Bombay Station. The second half of the Power Cat Podcast from Autumn Cat Snyder. Of course, deflected when asked why his team starts so slowly in the first. For in the first half and then turns it on in the second half. Uh, it has been especially prevalent this year. However, it seems like it has been like that since I can remember. Why do you think this is such a systemic issue? Uh, I don't know. It didn't used to be that way. I always, it's been that way for, you know, kind of more recent years, I guess. And I always thought they kind of got away with it, so to speak, because people were always just like, Oh, Bill Snyder's such a smart coach. He'll make halftime adjustments. He always makes halftime adjustments. Like, that was the cliche. Like, now it's Bill Snyder teams play clean football, don't beat themselves, great special teams, which isn't necessarily true. Um, But, like, that was the cliche was that Bill Snyder teams made halftime adjustments, and so nobody really ever pointed out the flaws in the slow starts of the first half. I think they're too generic on offense. Yeah, it's almost like they come into games thinking – What's the least amount we can show and do and still get away with it? Well, now, look, there's some truth to that. Um, but on both sides of the ball, he likes to not show a lot of stuff in the first half and then the second half when the other team doesn't have a full 
halftime break to make adjustments. He likes to show different things. So they have done that, but uh, whatever they're doing in the first half, stop doing that and do something different. <laughs> How's that for coaching? We're, what we did, we're not going to do that. We're going to go over here and do this. God. Just do that. From GPC Brian Gates. Oh, for God's sakes. That's really? a legit question. I don't know. It's a legit question? Yeah, it's a legit question. Okay. Yeah. Stan, will, will you give my son a praise, please? Go ahead. <laughs> why does why does Brian sound exactly like you, Zach, ordering a hamburger? I don't know. Why does it sound like Mole Atmore? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's Brian Gates. <laughs> from Stan Weber. Uh, no, it's from, from Brian. <laughs> Stan's on the podcast? <laughs> oh, my goodness. From Brian. He asks... Well, he makes a big statement and then asks a question at the end. But he asks, Stan Weber talked about the timeouts during the game. He said that the first half timeouts were for using whenever, but the second half were for the end of the game and that you should take the five-yard delay penalty rather than using a timeout. What are your thoughts on this issue? Oh, it just depends. Uh, there's some nuance to that. I mean, I'm all for maybe using two timeouts the first half, but they sure as hell needed their third timeout after the sack. You know what I don't understand? How this staff can be so – can use timeouts so poorly at times, for instance. Fourth down and we're going to go for it? Eh, better go, call a timeout and send out the field goal unit with an inexperienced kicker. That was bizarre. I don't understand the waste of a timeout there. That was bizarre. We're going to go for it. Eh, let's call a timeout and change our mind and, and not go for it. It's usually the other way around. Yeah. Um by do agree in the second half, you got to be a little more careful about it. You need those in case you need to make a game winning drive. But there are times if you're in a third and one, you are going to you take that time out. Don't take the delay if for some reason you're in that situation. I mean, I, I get I get what he's saying, but there are times when it's appropriate to take the time out in the second half. I just wish they were overall more conscientious about use of timeouts and. You know, leaving don't leave yourself without one at the end of either half because they bit them this week. I think people just get so frustrated by K State timeouts because it seems like eighty five percent of the time a K State timeout is the quarterback burning it on second and eight, right? When they can't get a play, and I understand the frustration. Frustrates me watching it too, but also I think I'd rather have my quarterback burn a timeout and make sure. You know, because he doesn't like the play that's being called and he can't doesn't have time to audible rather than run that play and hope you don't turn the ball over. I noticed Oklahoma State was audibling when they were changing the play at the line of scrimmage with like 15 seconds left. K-State's like eight. It's bizarre. They're just always kind of operation time running slower on the front end than most programs, and that, that falls on the coaches too. I got Marcus's thoughts on the issue here. He said, I, I asked him to record one, but he wouldn't. Okay. He refused. He said, "I don't have thoughts really on this besides that you use your own you use your timeouts on offense when you think you should, and the more you can save, the better for the second half." Well, you don't save them over halftime. He's talking about basketball. No, I think he was just saying. Yeah. I think he's. I think he was saying two things. Doesn't Marcus isn't very good at texting. No, he isn't. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about So Marcus this. didn't exactly have many thoughts. Let's talk about how Marcus sucks at texting. <laughs> he doesn't. He misspells everything. It's unbelievable. Doesn't get his point across. I don't know. Okay, I'm done talking about Marcus. From Yo Mama, how much impact has Denzel Goolsby's return had on the defense? I, among the things I can't explain in life is how he came back from surgery this quickly. There's something there. I don't know what it is, but when we asked him about it on Saturday, he kind of grinned. Laughed about it. I don't know what it is. Like, I, is he getting a shot of something? I don't know. Probably but PRP. Like, there's some something cells. there. I don't know. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's helped a lot, and particularly with Kendall Adams dinged up now too. So, yeah. Well, and uh, Eli Walker has been making some plays since Denzel has come back, which I well, I mean, not not that he wasn't making plays before. It just seems like he's kind of in the in a better spot now with mm -hmm. Denzel back. It's just, not exactly rocket science there. Well, Eli Walker settling in and getting really good. Really, really good. So, yeah, it's helped a lot. You get a smart, intelligent guy who uh, knows his way around the field. It always helps. 
From Freud 101, this was Duke Shelley's best game since... Ever. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Brian Norwood has been really good for the corners. I mean, have they been perfect? No, but they're learning. They're getting better. He's up in the receiver's catching zone. That's how he got the interception. He was just between the ball and the receiver with his arm, and it bounced and bounced, and he got it and grabbed it. And it that, was, was that was one of impressive. the most conscious plays I've ever seen. Because, like, I think if you go back and watch it, he, like, swipes up at the ball, knocking it out. I mean, it was, that was incredible uh, presence of mind to do that. But uh, I was trying to think. I think it was Texas his freshman year. Not Texas. It was either TCU or Baylor his freshman year. He did really well. I can't remember which well, one. TCU got lit up pretty good. So it would have been Baylor. I think, yeah. But this was all around good. I mean, he's he was tight coverage throughout this game. He's really advanced a lot, and I give Brian Norwood a lot of credit for that, the new, the new secondary coach. For which one again, don't get me wrong, the, f- the run defense looked very solid, but am I wrong in saying that lots of Oklahoma State's offensive struggles were because they dropped a lot of passes and Cornelius missed a lot of open guys, especially in the short passing game? I don't know why they didn't just keep feeding Hill. Uh, it's not like... Wear, wear him down, you know? Uh, well, he wasn't playing very well, and K State shut him down in the past, but they just abandoned him. They just, yeah. It was very strange. I thought it was a poor all around effort for Oklahoma State from the coaches, play calling on down. Yeah, you know what? Cordelius just wasn't very good. He wasn't. He got a little pressure. He got enough, they got enough pressure on him to be disruptive, make him uncomfortable. Um, he runs goofy. Taylor Cornelius is unfairly judged this year because he doesn't have game experience. I mean, yeah. flat out. I think he could be a really good quarterback if he had a year or two under his belt, but he's just not going to get that. So he's going to go down as the quarterback that took Oklahoma State from a 10-win team to a maybe 6-win team, and people are going to try to blame it on him, and I just don't think he's necessarily responsible I got a lot that. more problems in quarterback. Yeah. I had a lot more. From Jim Cat, what is going on with Mike McCoy? At the end of this, at the end of last season, Fitz said he might have a health problem. Is this the same problem or something new? Yeah, Mike's done playing football. I mean, they haven't said it yet, and they won't say it. I think I've said it before. I think coach is trying to keep him engaged. Um, he has a neck issue that it's not going to be able to play on it. No, no, it's it's very dangerous for him to play. So that it's really unfortunate, but. That's the way it is, and I don't like you know talking out of turn with other people's health like that. But he's done. He's he's never going to play football again, and he's got to be careful in anything he does in life. So it's very very unfortunate, and he's very lucky he didn't get severely injured prior to them catching this. I'm told he went. He had a problem. They then he seemed to be healthy, and he went down in a non-contact drill, barely got touched. And had you know significant issues, and then they dug in deeper and found out that he has a very a spinal issue that cannot be addressed easily. At least we'll always have that one highlight of him trucking a Charlotte guy. That showed up as an ad the other day, dude. It's on my Instagram every single day. K State Sports sponsored ad: Mike McCoy trucking a Charlotte player in 2017. Interesting. I don't Buy your understand tickets it. for the KU game. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, from I Like Pickles Cat, you addressed this on the pregame podcast, and I wanted some clarification. In the 90s, Bill Snyder was able to find and recruit players from junior colleges starting in November and December. I thought the new transfer rules could open recruiting for solid players late in the cycle. You said transfers couldn't be the same in today as JUCOs were in the 90s. Could you further explain the difference between transfers now and JUCO players in the 90s? I think I misunderstood this question. He's talking about transfers, like Division One transfers. I mean, JUCO players now are hard to recruit because people are recruiting them full on. A lot of them are committed before the season even starts. A lot of them have been placed, and and so they're just not in play to be recruited late in the cycle. I K State probably is going to need to look at some Division One transfers after the season. They're you know. They have as many guys leaving as Jalen McCluskey. <laughs> we, we fear they might. Um, they're going to have to look at some things, but 
Yeah, I mean, it's just too competitive now for junior college guys. To me, people are in there recruiting throughout the season and, and before the season and locking down guys. There's some guys available late, but usually they're the strong, the, the most the most difficult academic situations where you're not sure they're going to get eligible, and that's why they're available late. From Purple Cheese, how did we lose to Baylor? That will be the game this season that could be the difference in a bull and no bull. With you. Or at least a decent bull, or the lowest Big Twelve and lowest in the Big Twelve pecking order. I agree. I think they're going to finish five and seven. I fear they will too. And you're exactly right. Jesus, that game's going to stick out. That game's going to hurt because uh, they should have won it. They didn't win it. They had an opportunity to get it done. Couldn't get it done. Baylor's improved. There's no doubt. I mean, they just went to Texas and and played a really strong game and almost knocked off the Longhorns and. I don't think the conference is very good overall, but it is hyper-competitive. And, and uh, maybe that means K-State will finish on the right side of this and finish strong and beat Oklahoma, whatever however you want to look at it. Uh, but uh, Baylor is going to haunt them. If they finish 5-7, and seven, the way they let that one go, that will stick with them. But let's also preface the – or clarify the should have won it, and let's make sure people don't think that was a game that they des- – they didn't deserve to win that game, I don't believe. No, I – no, um, they made the crucial mistake that cost the game. Baylor had mistakes in special teams, but K-State had the big mistake in special teams. Um, and honestly, Baylor is getting back. They, they looked more talented than they were last year. They looked better coached, not particularly on defense, but they're making progress. And it, from where they kind of were on probation in a way. You know, it wasn't a formal one, but a lot of guys left. Last question of the second half from Yao Power. Are there any truth to the rumors that a search firm has been hired, I assume, for a new head coach? Is that yeah, what? I think I meant to add that in, and okay. I forgot. No, I, I, they wouldn't. They're okay. not, nobody's, they might have uh, someone out there sifting through names, but there will be a search firm named Gene Taylor Incorporated. I mean, Gene Taylor will go out, and that's his job. That's what an AD does nowadays. Yeah, I never understood search firms. That makes sense to me. Why? What, what's the point? Well, here, here's the point. Here's what a search firm does. A search firm can go out and talk to the agents and say, is your guy available? Is he interested in School X, School Z? And that's what search firms do. They're not just representing School A. They have A, B, C, D. And they're able to go out to these agents and say, okay, are these guys interested in this? Well, who's interested in this? And who do you got? Da, da, da. The school can say, no, we haven't talked to Coach so-and-so. And the coach can say, no, I haven't talked to school so-and-so. And they're not lying because they have it. They've done it through media, media, mediation. You know, they've had representative for both sides. The coaches always get away with this. Oh, no, I haven't talked to Kansas State. I haven't talked to da-da-da. No, your agent has, and you've talked to him. So they're not lying, but they are, you know. Plus, it, you're not going to go and hire, even if it was true, you're not going to go hire a search firm. When you're, I truly believe he's not decided yet what he's going to do. No. So why are you going to go hire a search firm when he could still coach for another three seasons, four seasons, you know? Now, if they have, and I don't believe they have, they're doing it in a vague way for the future. may not be this year, but let's identify people out there um, and let's identify problems. If, you know, this guy uh, looks good on paper, but behind the scenes, everyone hates him because he's a jerk to people. You need to know that. You, you know, if the guy's Ron Prince all over again, can win an interview, but is awful to players and employees, then, you know, you need to know that going in. Be prepared. So maybe in, you know, a bigger picture, that's what they're doing. But no, I don't think search for him. When, when it comes time to hire a coach, Gene Taylor will, will be the search for him. He, he knows what he wants, and he'll go out and find him. That's his job. That's why he gets paid the big bucks. It's not, he's just not eye candy. Well, he is, but he's so much more than eye candy. A 55-year-old man, you? Four. You're 54? Four. Saying that Gene Taylor, a 63? I don't know. Damn handsome man right there. Saying that he is eye candy is something else. I apologize to Gene Taylor if you're not 63. He's a, he's I was taking a guess. I don't, that I don't sounds know. way too old. It does sound too old, but do you believe that Bruce Weber is 62? That's a damn handsome man, too. 
See, what's different here is I'm secure in my manhood. I can say these things. Let's see. Keep talking. I'm not going to keep talking. Why would you not keep talking? I wanna, I wanna that would help old, you out. I want to find out how old Gene Taylor is. I want to go to break. I want to move on in this podcast. But instead, we're just stalling now, trying to make people think it's longer than it actually is. <laughs> uh, Gene you? Taylor is 61. Yeah, I was pretty go. damn close. Yeah, but that, no. 63 and 61, big difference. That's it for the second half. We'll be back with the overtime. I'm told it's not the best overtime. I'm told the goods were not delivered. Could could have been better. Could have been better. better. And you know what? What a a tease for. for (laughs) That's a good way to describe the entire podcast this week. Eh, Could have been better. We'll be back. The gang will return with more of the Power Camp Podcast. I'm trying to get a group text in on what everybody wants on the liquor store run, but my phone keeps auto-correcting liquor store to the fridge. A fridge or the fridge? The fridge. It just did it again. Well, the fridge is more than just a liquor store. The fridge has over 3,000 wines in stock, the area's largest selection of spirits and craft beers, plus their back-to-back winners of Beverage Dynamics Retailer of the Year. Oh, I get it. Wow. Smartphone. Autocorrect your next liquor store visit to the Fridge Wholesale Liquor, 1150 Westport in Manhattan, online at fridgeliquor.com. For more than 20 years, there's only been one reliable source for exclusive and unmatched premium K-State sports news content. It's GoPowerCat.com. The tradition continues as Tim Fitzgerald, D. Scott Fritchin, and the other GoPowerCat sports experts continue their relentless coverage of K-State sports. So make sure you're subscribing to the one and only GoPowerCat. Hey, K-State fans, it's time to come home to GoPowerCat.com. Back to Fitz on the Power Camp Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. It's the overtime. Woo! Woohoo! Yeah. That, we'll try to sell it uh, on the Power Camp Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Get into the fridge, say hi to the whole gang, get some liquor, get some beer, get some holiday cheer alcohol right there at the fridge. Halloween, right? Get, get the Halloween beers. Pumpkin spice. Aren't the Christmas? Didn't, didn't we advertise for Christmas beers last week? Yeah, yeah, we did. They got them in already. They got the, all those holiday beers. Stop in the fridge right there on the, the west side of town. Mm. Right there, out there. And uh, we're this segment sponsored by the Hilo. Stop in, see Seth and Adam, and all the bartenders and waitresses, and say Hilo. Never, never get old to me. I saw Seth the other night. He was part of the Chiefs watch party. Part of, he played a role in the Chiefs losing. Long to me. I really need to get my chair tightened up. It's really loud. Do you guys hear that? I cut it out once in a while. Please let us know if you hear it in the podcast. Here we go. Here, this is my chair. Oh, I so heard that. There we go. There we go. My, that is my chair crying for help. That is what a chair in distress sounds like, folks. Uh, here we go. It's overtime. I'm told it's not very good. We won't be here long on the overtime. That was nice. <laughs> From I Like Pickles Cat, talk dirty to me. And by that I mean, please tell me that KU basketball will be facing sanctions soon. Okay, Riley, look, I was prepared to answer this question and say nothing's going to happen. But then literally, right before we record this, something happens. Yeah, it looks like uh, KU assistant coach Curtis Townsend has been caught on tape talking about recruitment of Zion Williamson, who actually didn't go to KU. He's at Duke. But, uh, you know, he he straight up says that they're going to do whatever it takes to get him there for 10 months. So and When when the topic of money right, in the and, pocket and, came in. Yeah, oh. they've talked about paying him on the phone huh. call. Uh, this doesn't – it's not going to come back on Bill Self until he gets tied to something because he can claim ignorance all he wants um, and get away with it, frankly. But I don't see how Curtis Townsend survives this. Well, I, w- and, I wouldn't be shocked if Curtis Townsend loses his job in the next week. And he's a representative of Kansas. Right. So the, the program should. 
Look, at the end of the day, I don't think anything's going to happen because KU's a big moneymaker for the NCAA, and they don't want to do this. They don't want to get into punishing KU and North Carolina and Duke and all the programs that are obviously doing things to get these players. Obviously, there's a market for these players. I brought this up a long time ago. People were really mad at, at Oklahoma State and Travis Ford for upping the bidding process to get Marcus Smart. I mean, that was known in the industry that that he had blown the lid off of what had been the ceiling to get a player. This is going on. Everyone knows it, but they don't want to know it. They don't want it to hurt the sport. And this could really damage the sport. And thus, I think the NCAA say, look, a lot's been going on here. We're not going to get into punishing specific schools. Let's just stop it from here forward. I can see him doing that. I guess it just a lot of it falls on the line of what crosses. I guess where where do you draw the line on on this was an NCAA violation? This was a federal law. Well, those broke. are two different things, right? That's what I'm saying. Is I mean, this is a this is a court thing about Adidas and and defrauding schools, and so that'll be decided. But evidence will come out that. Simply put, the NCAA can't get – they can't wiretap people. They can't listen to conversations. That's why everyone's been getting away with it. They really can't even get emails. I mean, the programs – the schools have to turn over emails, but do you think they are? I I don't. I I don't think any head coach is going to lose their job over this. I don't think any schools are going to get slapped with a, you know, two-, three-year postseason ban or anything like that. Because, as you said, that's going to – who's watching the NCAA tournament that closely if Kansas and Kentucky and Duke are, are suspended? But yeah. I do think there will be guys like Tur- Curtis Townsend that lose their job because every staff has that guy. They have their fall guy that well, they, they have know. their guy that handles this stuff. Right. And Bill Self knows it's going on, but prove that he knows it's going on. Hey, I, it goes on. And the problem at the end of the day is if anything does happen, as you mentioned, the – Reward will far exceed the risk. Okay, we got, we're not going to go to the postseason one year, and we're going to appeal that, and then you'll probably give it to us. Or, or something else happens. Oh, we get our, our visits cut. You know, we can only bring in so many players. Just nonsense stuff. You're playing for national titles. It's worth it. It's worth the risk to cheat. It really is. And if they don't do anything when, when they have strong evidence – then they're just saying, you know what, go for it. Screw it, we don't care. And at that point? Here we go. At that point, if you're Kansas State, if you're any other school, you need to do it. Bruce Weber and Chris Lowry better be on the first flight out to St. Louis and offering every four- and five-star It's crazy. sizable check. It'll, it'll really change the sport forever if they don't act on this, but they're just afraid they're going to hurt the sport. Okay, well, at, you know what, at the end of the day, I bet you nothing happens. It's Kansas. You don't think Townsend is going to lose his job? Not, yeah, I think he might. Oh. But it's Kansas. Yeah. It's Kansas, so it'll be fine. And that's hard for people to hear. Okay, Zach, next question. From KSU Cat, uh, 2010. Every coach is allowed an off season. I think he means bad season because there's off seasons every season. <laughs> but this is one of Mike Gundy's worst teams he has had. With the pressure from his athletic director and T. Boone Pickens himself and his failing season this year, should Mike Gundy have taken the Tennessee job last year? If I was Mike Gundy, I would have taken the Tennessee job regardless because I could not work for Mike Holder. I know, and you could keep your tie collection. (laughs) Different orange. Ah, it's close enough. Yeah, Yeah, you're right. Uh, Yeah, he probably should have. But if he's let go, he'll be hired. And if he's let go, Oklahoma State could regress into, you know, some issues. He's a good coach. Not great coach? No. But he's kept it together there. It's just they hit a cycle here where things aren't going so well. I don't think they'll get bowl eligible. I haven't gone through their schedule, but they've already played Kansas. They played Kansas State. They've lost at home to Iowa State and Tech. They're in trouble, man. They are in trouble. I mean, what do you got? You bringing it up? Yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it up here. They're gonna play Oklahoma, or excuse me, of course they're gonna play Oklahoma State. Uh, they play Texas next weekend. At, they're off this weekend. At where? Uh, Oklahoma State. It's at Oklahoma State. Okay, that's a huge game. Then they get at Baylor. They will win that game. 
I don't know about that. I uh, do. I think I, – okay. You think they're going to win at Baylor after the, – I've seen the two teams now, and I think – Transitive property does not work. I'm not talking about compared to K-State. I'm talking about that Oklahoma State team look like they're quitting. Okay, you can say that, but I would also like to point out the Oklahoma State team that – Beat a pretty decent Boise team, forty-four to twenty-one. That hung. Are 40 they t- decent? Do we I mean, know they were. All, they're, they're all right. I mean, it's not like they're the, the Boise of old. We'll see what they, they do against Texas. They also hung forty-two on Iowa State. I mean, uh, you want to talk about off weeks? It's uh, just an off week. Okay. And then they play at, at Oklahoma. Well, yeah, at Oklahoma, home against West Virginia at TCU. Yeah, I think you get two out of that. I don't think they will. Even if they miss a bowl, going to Tennessee, though, is still kind of a dead-end job right now. So They just won at Auburn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, basically, uh, Auburn could fire Gus Malzahn and end up at Oklahoma State. Or, Les Miles is available. Yeah, I don't think they're going to go back down that road. What if he went back? Would that make Mike Gundy Oklahoma State's Ron Prince? <laughs> Very long-term wow. Ron Prince. A uh, better than the better original. Ron Prince. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get to classify yourself as the Ron Prince when you were the better of the two? <laughs> Ron Prince is available. All 80s. No, he's not. He's working in the NFL. I don't think he is right now. I'm pretty sure he's still with the Lions. Ah, that old staff got let go. When? Last season? Last season. No, nah, he's somewhere right now. Oh, for God's sake. Next question. Go okay. ahead. From Dan, the Wildcat fan. Uh, he went to the beer garden, and he says it was great. Is this the first step towards beer sales throughout the stadium? Michigan. The, he's at Michigan. Oh, yeah. He's like one of those unpaid – well, not unpaid, but like non-coaching coaches. Right? He is – Volunteer assistant. An offensive analyst. Right, right. <laughs> and truly, he's a guy that puts uh, anal into analyst. Uh, Sorry, Dan. Didn't mean to step on your question there. Uh, uh, yeah, that's Tailgate Terrace area. I don't think this is necessarily no, the first step. I've but. been told flat out they will not, with Bill Snyder, they will not have beer sales in the stands. He just is opposed to it. And that's where I would come back at you, not you, but anybody with the argument of whose university, whose football team is. Look, there's there. That's a it's a benefit. You need to make money. It is a positive thing. For your school. When your daughter's been permanently injured by a drunk driver, you see things a little bit differently. I get that. I understand. So it won't happen, and nobody's going to say, ah, Bill, it's okay. It's just not. It's not. It's. Is this the hill you're going to die on? Nobody's no. going to fight over that one. No. So, but it could happen. I'm not sure Gene Taylor's a big fan of it. Um, in it does. It, it opens up a lot of issues with crowd control, behavior control. We just saw it on Sunday Night Football, you know, a 23-year-old that can't help, can't maintain himself throws a beer on a player. So, I say the day they allow beer sales will be the day that in and out stops. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they're going to let anybody go in and out if they. Sell I mean, beer. that will be a function of it. Yeah, yeah. No, you can't go out to your tailgate. You're either out or you're in. Mm-hmm. We've got beer sales in here. Yeah, that's exactly it. From Sir Wright, how long did it take to not be nervous when asking Snyder a question you know he doesn't want to be asked? And is this taught in journalism school to pucker up and ask? It's definitely taught. Yeah, it's definitely taught. Because it's, what what are you doing this job for if you're too afraid to ask a question? But I don't ever remember being too nervous to ask him a question. But, of course, when I started covering them regularly in 98, I was, you know, I'd been... A sports writer for a while. So. The only time I was or nervous five, I was, was the first few times, and that's just because, you know, I was 18 years in the making of just following K-State football, you know, and now I'm talking to Bill Snyder. So that was the only quote-unquote nervous moment, but that didn't take long to shake. I, I can't say I was I – mean, there's been times where I've, like, asked a question before and I've been like, don't know if I really want to ask this question – don't know if I want to be the guy that gets yelled at, but a lot of times people like Kellis take care of it for me. So, <laughs> for real. Yeah, I mean, there's it's truth. The only time, and it's not really nervous. It's just like uncertain. Like NCAA tournament, when you take the mic and you're afraid you're on. You know, you don't know it, but you're on like TV somewhere. Like maybe yeah. they cut in, and you're about to ask, fumble through a question, and just end up with you know. 
What? They, I, didn't, I didn't hear you, son. Yeah, what? just just end up being the guy who kind of trails off the end. The worst is Big 12 Media Day. Big 12 Media Day, you're there in front of... It's your peers. 90 sports writers. Uh, football? It's more than yeah. that, I think. 90, 100, something like yeah, that. I mean, there's that. a ton of media there. And not only do you have a microphone in front of everybody, you stand up. Stand up, and all the cameras are on you. Yeah, because Fox is carrying that, and it's and it's not like at K State where we have the mic and we talk into it, but we can't hear ourselves. They play it on the speakers, so like right. you're talking through speakers and you're hearing yourself, and you get caught up. It's complicated, and then you start doing karaoke, sure, like instinctively. And Bill Snyder can never find you at that thing. He's always looking around, trying to like, where's the question? Where's the question? <laughs> looking like he's looking in the sun. Yep. No. Not, n- no, not no, because 95, when I started covering it full time, I was, you know, 31. So you're old. I was old. See, I've never asked him a question because I'd have to yell at him from the back. Yeah, you can do what Tyler does and go sit in the front. The new setup no. is not good. The new setup is not ideal for TV questions. No. Because then if I did that and then went down, but if he shifts himself, like there's still some shiftiness you got to do to your camera. I'm sorry, you say shift? Sh- Shifty. Okay, okay. Shifty. Okay. I'm afraid you said something else. Okay. No, no bleeps here. Okay. Uh, from Autumn Cat, uh, was the dunk contest at Madness the worst dunk contest ever held? It was a great dunk contest except for the fact that Dean Wade got a ridiculous 30. I'm sorry, Jacob Poland. Get your things together. Come on. A bad dunk contest. I thought it was, it was so great. bad. They set those guys up to not succeed. They, they practiced. They cooled down. They came out. They... You know, kind of hung out. They didn't really warm back up and then go dunk. I'm sorry. I thought that Austin Trice and Sean Neal Williams were well, great. Sean, Sean Neal Williams should have won it. Yeah. It should have been Trice and Williams in the final. And Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was. But I thought the, the dunk contest was fine. It was a farce. Um, it wasn't good. Well, yeah, because a three pointer one. Who wants a freshman or a JUCO transfer to win the dunk contest? No, you want Dean Wade. Woo! He's not. He's a good dunker, but he's not a great dunker. He's just, just not the legitimate champion. Yeah, it's so stupid. Okay, it stunk. Well, how about the madness in general? I, there was a question. I don't think I put it in there, but they, they said the person that's, that posted the question about it in general said they watched it on Facebook and said they didn't think it was all that. Like it was just kind of thrown together and not that good of an event. But oh, I thought it was terrific. I thought it was, put, I thought it was well done. I thought it was a really, really good event. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was well weird how the women's team didn't do hardly anything. Like they came out for the three point contest, and they did like a three man weave for like two and a half minutes. Yeah, but I think it was just a realization, and and the coaches knew it that people aren't there to see the women. Yeah, they're 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 the women are there so they can be in front of the crowd, but really they're there to see the men. Yeah, I you know. And the way I liked, I appreciated the way they did the uh, the three point contest. They paired the men and the women, but everyone still mentally counted the shots. Women have a smaller basketball; it goes through the rim easier than the men's ball. Let's point that out. It's significantly smaller. Um, but I would like to say, if you do it that way, the women easily won the three point contest, and I'm prepared to say the women also won the dunk contest. Yeah, I mean, they made more three-pointers, yeah. so. It was that bad. Women won. The, I'm just going to say, by not participating in the dunk contest, the women won. So which one won? Can we pick a winner? Ah, uh, Kayla Gaw. Can we just say she won? Sure. Okay. I mean, Sarah Bates had the highest score. There we go. Sarah Bates okay. won the three-point contest, so then she won the. Th- since Congratulations to five foot seven Sarah Bates on winning the dunk contest. Shooting a three-pointer counts in the dunk contest, so she wins. Um. What's next? He's lost. He's I don't know. Lost. Come on, man. We got like six questions for the overtime. I guess. Well, there was a second question in that, and it was about the the women. Is it normal for the women to be better than shooting threes? But you answered that question. Yeah, I mean, I part. think that goes to it a little bit, but I also do think this women's team is a better three point shooting team than this men's team. Like they they literally are a team of of a lot of shooters. So well, I really look, wasn't that. I, I've, I've said this before. Women's basketball is what men's basketball was. Honestly, in like the 60s. It's about fundamentals. It's about 
cutting. It's about playing zone defense a lot of times. It's about shooting the ball because they're playing below the rim, which was quite common back then. Now we're beginning to see women playing above the rim, but they, they aren't able to do some of the flashy things that guys get themselves caught up in. I want to I want to spend hours and hours on learning how to do this dunk. No, they spend hours and hours on standing out there shooting three-pointers. Yeah. And so I think that's a little bit of the difference. If you like fundamental basketball where they do little things right, women's basketball is actually in some ways better than that. It's less athletic. It's below the rim. All of that. Um, but there's there's just it's a different game, simply put. From Jim Cat, did K State and or Colin Klein get paid royalties for the Samsung commercial? Did they pull that? Did they? Yeah, apparently they switched it out. I, I mean, I didn't see. They put it. someone we else in there now. Yeah. What did they put in there? I don't know. I, I, wonder, I was at the game with you. How would I have seen it? Well, I wondered if you were on the tweeter machine. I wondered. All I saw was an uproar. Oh my god, they took Colin Klein off the commercial. I wonder if they went to something generic. I don't know. I honestly don't know, and I haven't asked, and I would have to ask. I didn't You'd have to think, though, right? You would have to think. I mean, they didn't, um, they didn't blur a power cat out or anything, or but, names or but anything. But maybe that's why I got pulled. Maybe. I won, I, I won. I mean, that could be. But at the same time, I mean, as, from an NCAA standpoint, you got to pick footage that's at least five years old to make sure that no one in it is possibly mm-hmm. playing since it's an ad. Right. No. But unless they were a sponsor of the game or... If they had some deal with whoever broadcasted the game, was it the Cotton Bowl? No, it was well, the was Fiesta, it? Fiesta Bowl. So if they have some deal with ESPN, that I don't know. I don't know. That was weird. From uh, Parker, he asks, "Have you seen a movie in a theater twice, and what was it?" Oh yeah, last last year I saw the Solo movie at least twice. The what movie? Solo. The Han Solo movie. Oh, that's funny because I th- I think. It was Star Wars movies when I was yeah. in that age bracket that I would have seen. Actually, the last two Star Wars. So, Solo and then, uh, what was the one before that? New Hope? This question is more relevant for your generation because you, ha- you have access to seeing the movie in eight months, 12 months, mm-hmm. in high def, in your living room. Like, I watched Solo. I never went to it in theaters. I watched it at home a couple weeks ago. So, this, you know, for me, when I was growing up, you weren't, this was how you're going to see the movie. It wasn't going to be on TV. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't going to be on HBO uh, until much later down the road. Oh, the post, too. I saw the post three times in the, the post? theater. Interesting. I'm still Incredible like, movie. Hmm. I saw Baywatch twice last year. Had a boy. I never saw that one. It was okay. It's funny. It's funny. It, people try to take it too seriously. They're like, oh, it's got a state of the book kind of thing. It's like, yeah. man. Well, it was making, well, the, the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's making yeah. fun of itself. I do have all the Baywatch books. Although I will say this. <laughs> unless you, like, good read. and this is, this kind of makes fun of Beloit a little bit, but for real, unless you live in a place like Beloit, it's kind of tough to go to a movie more than one time. I mean, if you go to a movie here, you'll end up spending, you know, like twenty five, thirty dollars and then you do that two, three times. Plus you got other options. There's there's twelve movies. All right. But th- there was two movies in Beloit. Come on now. Two, Come on 12. now. But I two, but I could 12, go to same thing. I could go to a movie in Beloit for ten bucks and get the ticket, popcorn and a drink. Yeah, ten bucks total. Your grandma's not gonna spend more than that to go to a movie with her friends. So, well, that's what I'm saying is it's a lot easier to do it in a place like that than it is here. Then, again, I watched the post three times here. so, And now they have beer at this movie theater. This movie theater is really nice. I don't have to leave my recliner, and I can push a button and order a beer. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Food's pretty good. It's incredible. Yeah. Fritch loves going there. It's kind of his thing during basketball season. Yeah, I just don't do movie theaters that often. Speaking of Fritz, the last question of the podcast is from Alec Pickleskat, and he asks why he isn't on the podcast. It's not his thing. I mean, he hops in on the the pregame podcast just for the roundtable and prediction. That's kind of a limited thing. It's in his contract. Fitz makes him. Yeah. Um, It's just not – he just said – he wants to write. You know, he's not – He doesn't like his voice. (laughs) It's funny because it's actually really good. Yeah, I know. Um, But – and also, we we tape this – Typically, not always, but Tuesday evenings, and because of Tuesday 
football press conferences, that's his big day. So he's quite often, folks, he prepares. He doesn't just show up at the press conference like I do. He prepares, and he's been in here in the morning preparing, doing research, getting ready to write. Because when he comes back to write, he doesn't want to have to add in all the research then. I mean, he wrote 3,200 words in his 321 this week. And he wrote that upon returning from the press conference around 2 o'clock. Yeah. 2 o'clock. And he was done by 3.30, 4. It's amazing. Dude's insane. It's amazing. He's not throwing anything together. He's not half-assing anything. Uh, and, you know, so he's put in an eight-hour day. He's not going to – it's just not his thing. It's, it's for other people to do, and, and he writes and writes and writes, and he is damn good at it. We'll let him do that. We'll let, we'll let him do that. You know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from – uh, a very experienced business person slash entrepreneur when I started it. Do what you do. Let your employees do what they do. And then go hire people to do everything else. Like accounting, don't do that. Don't spend your time, your energy doing that. Hire an accountant. And, you know, and we do that. You know, don't, don't do things that are going to take away from what you do and why people want to be part of your business. And for D. Scott Fritchin, that's writing. And boy, does he write. So does that mean I don't have to paint tomorrow? You have to paint tomorrow. That's not what I do. It's off week. We can't do what we do because there's no damn games. I can write things. Zach and, I, Zach and I can play Fortnite in the office. There we go. There it is. We're back to Fortnite. This somehow, somehow, was our longest segment. I don't know how. We talked... We 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 hit off like a we hit a double right out of the gates with the KU question. Okay, that's it for the Powercat Podcast. We're brought to you by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Uh, you know, I, I feel like if you're in town and you haven't been to the fridge yet and you're of age, you're le- leading a really empty life. Okay, maybe you don't drink. That that's a perfect reason not to go. But if you do, uh, there's other good liquor stores in town. Just stop in the fridge. It really is different than everyone else. And thank you to our sponsors and our friends at Tanner's Wahoo and the High Low. Great people, great places. You know, just get in there and hang out and have a good time. Life is short. Make the most of it. We'll talk to you next week. No pregame podcast this week because there's no game. That's how it works. We'll be back with podcasting next week. And... Uh, the coverage continues at GoParacut.com. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing.